Marine protected areas come in all shapes and sizes and exist across a broad gradient of regulatory processes and effectiveness. In, in this class, we will learn about different types of MPAs and also other effective area-based conservation measures um, now referred to as OECMs. The, the growth of MPAs, um, some of the policy drivers and the design challenges and then we'll, we'll briefly look at performance and touch on some of the social factors and challenges in achieving um, policy goals such as ecological coherence in MPA networks. So what is a marine protected area? IUCN provide a, an institutional definition. Um, an MPA is a clearly defined geographical space recognised, dedicated and managed through legal or other effective means to achieve the long term conservation of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural values. And um, the, the key thing with the IUCN definition is that uh, an MPA must have the main goal or outcome of conserving nature. Um, and this this needs to be applicable to at least 75% of the MPA space or um, a mapped and recognised zone within an MPA. And um, IUCN provide six uh, broad categories for MPAs that range from a strict nature reserve, which is, tends to be no-take, um, through to various definitions uh, with increasing um, human interaction and potentially human impact uh, to the uh, category six, which is the protected area with sustainable use of natural resources, so a multi-use area. The IUCN guidelines have been written to increase the accuracy and consistency of um, classification and reporting of MPAs globally. But of course, there are many MPAs that have been put into practice for centuries before the IUCN guidelines existed. In, in many cultures around the world, the spiritual world through storytelling has helped to manage resources and protect species and places from human impacts. Traditional institutions such as taboos, um, tenure through fishing rights and um, totems can be extremely effective for marine conservation. And there are many examples and, and just a few here, including the protection of sea turtles through taboo in fishing communities in, in Ghana, in West Africa. Um, the Polynesian taboo or tapu places of spiritual restriction on uses, including the Rahui um, of the Polynesian islands and um, including New Zealand. Uh, the, the bull moratorium on fishing in Palau that um, is designed to protect people from food scarcity and customary fishing rights in Fiji and the Mataitai reserves in New Zealand, the Konohiki in the Hawaiian Islands um, all serve in some way to um, protect resources or to avoid disputes. The, um, uh, in the Hawaiian Islands the uh, Papahana Mokuakia Marine National Monument is considered um, to be an example of integration of cultural knowledge and tradition with, um, with modern science and, and modern marine management. Um, and this is one of the largest MPAs in the world. Um, these, these areas, these traditional um, techniques for protecting marine areas are often referred to by conservation agencies as locally managed marine areas. And they are considered by the IUCN um, under the category of other effective area-based conservation measures or OECMs. It's important to recognise that not all taboos or fishing rights are for conservation outcomes. In some regions, pre-European populations were at such low densities that um, 
uh, the, the, the reasons weren't for, uh, you know, to protect from overfishing. Um, they were for, they were social measures uh, such as fishing rights that were to clarify access to resource and avoid conflict between families, villages and communities, as opposed to uh, protecting marine biodiversity. I've included some, some links to some interesting papers in the notes on the, uh, in the PowerPoint slide. So where are these MPAs? Let's, let's turn to the latest version of the MPA Atlas. This is a database maintained by the Marine Conservation Institute in, in the US. And, it, and um, this latest uh, download shows a total of 16,727 zones and MPAs that collectively cover approximately 7.7% of the ocean surface. Um, this compares with approximately 15% uh, of the um, planetary landmass that is currently inside terrestrial protected areas. Of the marine areas, um, just over 1,000 are considered highly protected. This uh, is equivalent to approximately 3% of the global ocean. The majority of these MPAs um, are, are, are small areas, less than 10 kilometres square. But you can also see that if you look at the um, size class uh, breakout here on the bottom left corner, it shows that 0.4% um, of the MPAs are classed as very large, um, each more than 100,000 kilometres square. So let's take a look at the growth in area coverage for MPAs globally. And this chart from a, a paper led by Jane Levchenko published in 2015, nicely demonstrate the impact of um, policy, international policy that has resulted in designation of, of some very large marine protected areas in the uh, first with the Great Barrier Reef and then with the Pacific um, MPAs. And you can see here, if you look at the numbers along the red line, um, number three is the UN uh, Earth Summit and then number four is the World Parks Congress, number five the UN Convention on Biological Diversity and number six the, um, the Convention's uh, Aichi Targets and then number seven the uh, SDG 14 Life Below Water and you can, and you can see that the, um, these conventions coincide with the designation of very large marine protected areas in order to meet area-based targets. And here, um, beyond the 2015 uh, up, to, up to 2020, you can see that since 2015 there's been a, a growth in the um, area coverage in the areas beyond national jurisdiction, as well as within national waters. High level um, global biodiversity conservation policies seem to be the, the key drivers for the um, recent surge in designation of, of marine protected areas. And so the 10% the area target um, appeared in the Earth Summit in 1992. Uh, but it, implementation was, was slow and it wasn't really until the uh, uh, Convention on Biological Diversity in 2010, the Aichi Target 11, that the 10% the target re resurfaced. And if you look at the text for both the um, Target 11 and the UN Sustainable Development Goal, um, they, they call for at least 10% of the, of the world's uh, see to be effectively conserved through MPAs by 2020. Now the, the, the uh, success in achieving that goal varies by, by country 
uh, with some below and some meeting it and some uh, exceeding it. Um, now, the, the biggest challenge with target 11 is when you look at the not not at the quantitative area based target, but when you look at the qualitative target. And if you if we let's take a look at the text, it says especially areas of particular importance for biodiversity and ecosystem services are conserved through effectively and equitably managed ecologically representative and well connected systems of protected areas and uh, OECMs. Um, now that to actually achieve that requires uh, some uh, detailed information on where those areas, important areas are, uh, firstly, and then also, you know, um, some knowledge of uh, the ecological connectivity between those areas. Um, and um, this is, this has been quite a challenge in uh, achieving this, this goal. And then the, the last, the last piece uh, the text here says integrated into wider landscapes and seascapes, but there there hasn't really been much detail guidance on on actually what that means and how you know how how do we know when when that uh, integration is is appropriate or has achieved the, um, the 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 target in this case. Well, um, post 2020 discussions have been post postponed. They were due to occur in China. They are now um, going ahead this year, uh, and a, and a thirty percent target has been proposed, and so it's um, it's yet yet to be determined as to um, what happens next. But it, it it's very likely the thirty percent target will be uh, voted for. Um, I've included a video link here to to learn more about the the work of the Global Ocean Alliance and the thirty by thirty campaign. So we've heard that um, ocean spaces that are designated for other than um, direct conservation goals can also be con considered towards uh, meeting the area based targets. And it has been argued that um, OECMs, other area based effective conservation measures, um, will, will actually be essential to achieve the, um, the the ambitious conservation targets for 30% cover or the, the half earth target of 50% cover. Um, and also to, to sort of um, address some of the uh, goals for achieving ecological coherence in MPA networks. So for, for um, connecting MPAs um, by using non-MPA spaces in between them to create a coherent connected network. Um, so if we look at the definitions, de facto MPAs were uh, cl classified by NOAA, um, recognising that there were lots of areas that didn't fit the conventional MPA defi definition. And these are regions of the oceans where human activity is restricted for for reasons other than biodiversity conservation, um, such as military zones, sacred sites, oil and gas installations, uh, wind farms, shipping lanes, and, and also large offshore um, aquaculture sites that prohibit trawling and, and other fishing activity. Uh, they, they become these de facto MPAs. So they that, that class of, of non-MPA um, fits under the category now, the IUCN category of OECMs. And these are geographically defined areas which are governed and managed in ways that achieve positive and sustained long-term outcomes for conservation of biodiversity. Um, but it's not their primary goal. Ecological criteria are increasingly playing a role in site selection for MPAs. And this has been enabled by improvements in um, spatial mapping of uh, habitats and uh, distribution modeling. And you can see that um, this list from Callum Roberts uh, paper has a comprehensive range of um, criterion that are desirable for uh, site selection ranging from the, the sort of ecological attributes and also consideration of threats and vulnerability to habitats and, and, and um, 
life cycle characteristics. Um, uh, software is being used to pull all this information together and and uh, optimize site selection. And this example here is from the Arabian Gulf. Um, one of many examples of the application of Marksand software, that's software that uses mathematical optimization algorithms to, um, uh, to define optimal scenarios for uh, site selection and for MPA network design. And these, the, these types of approaches, systematic conservation planning approaches, um, they are able to bring user defined targets into the uh, analysis and um, find the um, lowest cost solution to meet the uh, stated goals and targets. And the Great Barrier Reef actually was the first example of Marksan application and since then there have been uh, hundreds of applications around the world. In the real world there's a complex suite of factors that interact to determine success in, um, in MPA uh, performance. And um, in, in, in 2014, Graham Ed Edgar et al. evaluated the ecological performance of, of 87 MPAs worldwide with a focus on shallow reef sites and their um, ability to recover fish biomass. Um, and they, this research discovered that five key factors correlated well with MPA success in recovering fish biomass. The highest performing MPAs had at least four of the following five features. They were no take, they were well enforced, they were old, more than, usually more than 10 years old, and they were large spatially, um, more than 100 square kilometres. And uh, a fifth factor was their isolation from adjacent fished areas where they were, they were uh, perhaps separated by deep water or sand. Um, they referred to these, these five factors as NEOLI, N-E-O-L-I. Effective MPAs also had twice as many large fish species per transect, five times more large fish biomass, and 14 times more shark biomass than fished areas. The results also highlighted that global conservation targets based on area alone will unlikely um, meet the needs for uh, for protection of marine biodiversity. Um, they argue that more emphasis is needed on better MPA design, durable management strategies and, and uh, compliance to ensure that MPAs achieve their conservation goals. Here in this example, I offer the Blue Parks criteria as an example of um, criteria developed to uh, help marine protected areas optimize their ecological and, um, and and social performance. And these are based on scientific evidence for successful MPAs. Uh, one of the cr criteria groups is design. And you can see that the Neoli um, five are well represented in the criteria here. But in addition, um, Blue Parks have also focused heavily on consideration of community engagement um, and um, other social measures, uh, for instance, effective management planning that includes target setting, monitoring and threat mitigation, as well as uh, looking at the way that MPAs are, are resourced financially, um, staffing and training and, and capacity building um, for the MPAs that are known to influence uh, success. Many examples exist around the world for positive boosting effects of, uh, of, of MPAs, especially those that are close to fishing. And here are just um, three examples from the literature. One at uh, Cabo Pulmo National Park in Mexico, showing that within 10 years of, um, of, of closure to fishing, the apex predators biomass increased dramatically and um, carnivores. And this is a desirable uh, expectation of, um, of, of closure to fisheries. 
and and then in southwest Madagascar, similarly increased biomass in areas inside the reserve versus outside. And then if we look at the, a global synthesis of 58 MPAs, we can see that there's um, a, a, a increase in biomass in uh, areas where fishing is prohibited, and, and also in multi-use areas where adequate a, adequate staff capacity, um, especially uh, allocated to enforcement is um, is available there. Um, spillover is another bene expected benefit and fishery spillover where the movement of animals from uh, inside the MPA to outside fishing grounds uh, it has potential benefits for the, the fishery. And this has been evidenced through animal movement studies um, and um, DNA parentage uh, analyses. MPAs are increasingly valued for their potential to mitigate climate change uh, through protection and enhancement of ecosystems with um, high blue carbon potential. Um, networks of MPAs are also being designed to increase resilience to climate change. This diagram just shows some of the ways that MPAs are thought to um, enhance the storage and the sequestration of, of carbon. Clearly, our expectations for ecological performance of an MPA must consider not just the type of protection, for instance, whether it's a, a no-take zone or a multi-use zone, and what sort of activities are, are permitted in, inside that area, but also what's happening in the surroundings. You know, we need to better consider local context in adjusting our expectations for ecological performance and also um, consider the species ecology. We tend to hear more about the positive um, boosting effects of, of uh, no-take MPAs. But have a look at this example. This is um, the uh, assessment of ecological performance for fish and, and coral um, in uh, across three uh, well-managed, well-resourced National Park Service MPAs in the US Caribbean, in the, in, in the Virgin Islands, the United States Virgin Islands. And if you look at the the summary results, they, they're almost all downward trends, and in many cases, both inside and outside of MPAs. And, and, and what this shows here is that in some regions, um, performance may be, may be very slow. You know, this is 10 years of monitoring and, uh, and, no, and no significant upturn in any of these metrics. Um, we need to consider the history of of degradation to coral reef ecosystems in the area. Um, you know, from the 1970s with uh, sea urchin die-offs and uh, mass coral bleaching with thermal stress, uh, several major hurricanes and um, disease outbreaks following a coral bleaching and uh, a lionfish invasion um, and so on. And so this has led to a, a, a much broader scale degradation of the of the marine ecosystem and perhaps masking any uh, positive um, effect of of uh, decreasing fishing activities in in um, MPAs. We also need to consider the um, size of MPAs relative to the movements of the animals that they're intended to protect. And um, in, in the US Caribbean, we examine this issue, this potential scale mismatch between MPA size and, and fish movements using acoustic telemetry. So we tagged, um, we tagged fish and then we measured their, um, their movement ability and then compared that with the known size of um, coastal MPAs in the Eastern Caribbean. And we showed that 72% um, of the fish that was uh, at least 16 species were capable of moving farther than uh, 40 to 64% of existing MPAs in the Eastern Caribbean. 
and 31% of fish um, were capable of moving greater distances than than the dimensions of of 83 to 96% of of MPAs. And so there's clearly a a, a scale mismatch occurring at least in this in this part of the world. It's not just fish movements that need to be considered. We will also need to look at the um, effects of, of closed areas on, on fishing fleets. And there's an inevitable um, displacement effect that influence the functioning of the fishery and uh, potentially the success of the, of the MPA. Um, yet often these displacement patterns are, are rarely quantified and um, after a reserve uh, or a closure has been implemented. Um, and these um, patterns are typically uneven geographically with cascading consequences that are, that are a real challenge to, to track. The displaced uh, fishers and their dependence on the closed areas as well as the ability to adapt and the, and the socioeconomic consequences will, will differ depending on the, the types of, of fishery affected. In, on the right hand side here you can see some data from one of the first major closures in the, in the Gulf of Maine to protect the, the ground fish from otter trawl fishing. Um, and this data was uh, the, the closure was in 94 and this data shows the uh, pattern of fishing in uh, at al almost a decade later and it shows um, that there there's potential fishing of the line where the the fishing vessels will fish along the boundary of an MPA um, potentially increasing their catch from from spillover and um, they found that 31% of the effort from um, that was originally inside the the blue polygon closed areas, 10 years later was 25%. 25% um, was within five kilometres of the boundary, and 10% within a kilometre of the MPA boundary. And this this just highlights the the displacement and the and the fishing of the line. Another example here is the Phoenix Islands, showing here um, on the left hand side, uh, one year before closure, the, the fishing effort, and then um, next to it, uh, a year after closure, showing quite clearly that um, uh, high compliance with the, with the MPA um, closure. However, the graph below shows that um, fishing effort continued to to increase and so you know where where was that displacement and on the, on the right hand side is um, a, a diagram from a, a paper that shows the various potential pathways in response to um, closures some of which may spill into adjacent protected areas and um, uh, some of it may be uh, temporary effort removal from the from the fleet or displacement to outside areas. Where um, social and political factors for MPA success and failure have been examined, the, um, some of the uh, top uh, factors for success have included high level of stakeholder participation, uh, along with supporting legislation and, and leadership. And, and for failures, lack of surveillance and um, and delayed stakeholder engagement um, have been highlighted as as key factors for failure. So um, where do we go from here? Uh, beyond Aichi's 10% area target, some countries have already surpassed that, and we're moving now with the um, post 2020 uh, Convention on Biological Diversity towards a 30% target by 2030, that's the 30 by 30. And, um, and then also um, uh, building on E.O. Wilson's idea for half Earth, which is estimated to protect 90% of, of the, the, the planet's um, 
species if that can be achieved with a, a 50% area target for, for the ocean. Um, this scenario here that was developed by researchers at Oxford, York and, and in collaboration with Greenpeace um, presents one scenario for a 30 area target and a 50 area target for the for the high seas for the areas beyond national jurisdiction uh, that's what the the map shows here and they estimated a, a cost to um, high seas fishing fleets of between 20 and 30 percent as i mentioned earlier some nations have already surpassed the um, targets the, the 10 and, and in some cases 30 percent target and um, looking at the Marine Protection Atlas data, it looks as though the UK has so far protected 71% of its um, sovereign um, ocean. And um, if we look at the data on the bottom right hand side, 34% is within highly protected areas. Now, most of these highly protected areas are, are outside of the of the the uh, UK, you know, England, Scotland, Wales uh, waters. Ironically, there's only one uh, MPA close to fishing in the in England, and that's Lundy Island. Um, all of the other areas are um, are outside in the overseas territories. Um, we've still got a long way to go in achieving. Uh, ecological coherence in our MPA networks. Um, there are additional improvements that can be made to better integrate community and regional MPA efforts, better linking social ecological systems through holistic frameworks, uh, implementing adaptive MPA planning and management uh, with respect to climate change and other, other environmental changes, and uh, incorporating ecological connectivity in our MPAs and MPA network design. Um, progress is being made and the uh, challenge of uh, uh, achieving ecological coherence is, um, is being made. Um, however, this example here in the Adriatic Sea, where the um, coherence and management effectiveness was evaluated, clearly showed that, um, that, it, that the existing um, network of MPAs was very unlikely to or, or highly unlikely to meet some of these um, uh, objectives that are required to um, for ecological coherent MPA networks. So representivity across the various habitat types, um, replication, connectivity and adequacy. A representativity is, is captured in a network when it consists of areas representing different biogeographical divisions or, or a full range of um, ecosystem types and habitat diversity. Um, replication of ecological features means that more than one site contains examples of a given feature, um, habitat, species, ecological process. And connectivity in the design of a network allows for linkages uh, between protected areas um, that add uh, you know, longer term resilience to the to the network. Adequate and viable sites are um, sites within the network that are of adequate size and with sufficient protection to ensure ecological viability and integrity um, for the long term. For, for coastal MPAs in particular, I've um, I for a long time felt that, um, that the assessment and mitigation of threats, uh, especially from land-based pollutants, has been inadequate for, for many MPAs. And so I just wanted to highlight um, some frameworks that have been put forward that have potential for looking at the, the causal chain. Um, the DIPSA framework you've probably heard about, which um, identifies driving forces uh, that link to pressures, um, impacts and, uh, and responses. And, and the two-way feedbacks, the, um, the extended DIPSA has, has a, a two-way feedbacks 
so it's a little bit more complicated but you know there are these these frameworks out there that um, really do do need to be applied especially to coastal areas and one example um, of, of cause and effect uh, through a very long history is this this fascinating study of um, a, a, a core through 300 years of um, uh, sediment deposition on a on, on a coral off the off the coast of of Kenya in the Malindi um, Marine National Park and essentially they the the study was able to track the um, the, the the chronology of impacts from river plumes from the Sabaki River that go back to uh, pre colonial days but they were able to see the colonial influ influence of land use change um, uh, in in the early 1900s and then uh, sort of post-war where agricultural practices changed which led to increased um, soil erosion and runoff and plumes into the river which then settled onto the corals in the marine park and uh, and affected um, their their environment you know and it's um it's a it's a causal chain uh, that goes back through hundreds of years and links to land use policy change uh, hundreds of miles from the marine protected area and just to finish up here i i refer you to three short videos one about the zoning of the great barrier reef um, a complex and long you know many year process that involves scientists and politicians and community groups and then also an example of um, a mechanism for financing mpas in this case in the seychelles using blue bonds that's a tnc initiative um, and then um, an example of attempts to uh, assess and uh, progress towards achieving ecologically coherent MPA networks in the in the UK um, through the work of J JNCC. Thank you.